Thanks for tuning in to another episode here again. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. And for this video, I'd like to share something from Father Daniel Rehill about something very important. Something that I think a lot of us have experienced and struggled with. And as Father Rehill said it here, our eternal salvation is on the line. Now, the other thing people frequently say to me is, you know, is uh, I don't want to forgive because that's like validating the evil that was done to me. Really, uh, forgiveness does not pretend that no sin was committed. That's not what it does at all. In fact, it does the opposite. By the very act of you forgiving, it's acknowledging that someone has sinned against you. Someone has hurt you. Therefore, there's no problem in forgiving. It doesn't tell the person that you're okay with it. It tells the person you're not okay with it, but you're choosing to extend mercy instead of justice. That's what forgiveness does. And that's a big difference from pretending it didn't happen at all. You know, in fact, if you don't address it at all, that almost is like saying it didn't happen. You know, uh, if the the person that hurt you doesn't know uh, how you're feeling, they might think it was OK. It, it wasn't a big deal for you. So when you make the choice to forgive someone else and your feelings don't immediately follow that choice, just keep forgiving them. Over and over, keep praying that prayer, Lord, bless and heal them so they can become the saint you made them to be and get home to heaven. You pray for them and you try to change the way you're thinking about them by trying to imagine them as the person before they were hurt. And don't dwell upon the hurt that they've inflicted. You know, that's not good for you. Dwelling on the pain is, uh, it'll leave you into self-pity and that's never healthy. Think instead about that person's dignity as created in God's image and likeness, and then forgive, forgive, and forgive again. You know, you, you never stop and you never tire of this act of mercy. Because remember, your eternal salvation is on the line. You know, it's one thing to be hurt by somebody and they've robbed you of a certain dignity in your life by whatever they did to you. It's far worse if you allow that transgression against you to drag you into hell because you refuse to forgive them, that would be the worst crime, you know? So don't let that happen to you. We can't be that person that doesn't want to forgive, you know, the free, and I've met people like this, that they're just not going to let it go. And it just, as I said yesterday, it literally is a cancer that's eating your soul alive and you got to get rid of it. The only way to get rid of it is to forgive. You begin by saying the words and praying for the person in your heart. And eventually Jesus will follow through by matching your emotions to what you've done in their forgiveness. And you'll have no more pain left. It'll be over. That's what we want to do. And I really like the next part of the clip where Father Rehill said that if we're willing to forgive, Jesus is never going to say no because he forgives before we even forgive. You know, at first he's simply telling us to pray for forgiveness as we forgive. But then he makes it clear that if we fail to do that, we will not be forgiven ourselves. And this should be like so motivating for us to make every effort possible to completely forgive others from the deepest depths of our hearts. This is not negotiable. This is a mandate. You can't be a follower of Jesus if you're unwilling to forgive. So who do you need to forgive? Well, forgiveness is such a baffling thing for many people because their, their, their uh, actions are ruled by their passions and their emotions. If you're ruled by your passions and emotions, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. Uh, the animals are ruled by their passions or by their instinct, you could say. So we're not animals. We have an intellect and a will that makes us like God. Uh, engage them. Engage your intellect and then engage your will. Our intellect tells us Jesus is asking me to do this, so I have to do this. And he's even promising that this is going to bring me happiness and peace. Therefore, I now get to engage my will and do it. So the will says, Lord, this harm was done to me and I don't, I did not like it, but I'm choosing to forgive this person and I'm asking you to forgive them too. 
let me tell you something. If you're willing to forgive, Jesus is never going to say no. He, because he forgives before we even forgive. So if we ask him to forgive as we are forgiving, he's going to do it. And he's going to extend mercy to that person. And that mercy will come in the form of grace that will hopefully transform the, the, the person's heart that hurts you and bring them to contrition and uh, also then for, that they would ask forgiveness for their, their sin against you. Uh, this is how it works. This is how it works. So uh, the act of forgiveness, you know, it gets very confusing when our feelings don't reflect the choice we make in our will. So you're choosing to forgive, but your heart is still very angry and mad. It's okay. It's okay. Because the very act of forgiving will temper your anger. It's like a, uh, one of those pressure cookers. By forgiving, it's like opening that valve at the top up and letting off all that steam and then it brings you to a place where you're stable. You'll be stable. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, although it could. Sometimes you have to keep forgiving day and day and day and day and day and days even more. Uh, why? Because in the process, all those times you're continuing to forgive and praying that the other person would be healed and forgiven, bless, bless and heal them, Lord, all those times you ask the Lord to do that, he's continually feeding them graces to change their heart. So if it's somebody very stubborn, it might take a little longer. But, you know, nobody can can outlast the grace of God. Nobody. And we have to be really careful because, you know, generally speaking, when people hurt other people, it's because they've been hurt themselves. And, um, you know, maybe they just never got past it. Maybe they never got healed of that. Maybe they're carrying that burden in their heart, and that's why they're 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 acting out in such a way. You know, and that probably hurts them as well. They don't want to become like the one who hurt them, and yet that's what they're doing, right? For the second part of this video, I'd like to share something from Father Forte instead. What to do if we're too ashamed to go to confession? While reconciliation is intended to allow Christ's victory to overcome sin in our lives. What happens when shame over one's sins is so great that it keeps people away from the sacrament? And here is where Father Fortea discussed this phenomenon and practical solutions to it. Normally, a sense of Christ's mercy should be enough to help people overcome their shame and go to confession in order to receive forgiveness and healing. However, in some cases, Father Fortea acknowledged people are overwhelmed by their sins and this shame becomes a wall keeping them away from reconciliation. They would rather make a 100-mile pilgrimage than have to confess face-to-face -face certain things they did that are terribly and frightfully humiliating to them. He said, reflecting on the torment that faces some penitents who struggle approaching the sacrament. Father Fortea also pointed out the importance of priests offering fatherly compassion on those who have these burdens on their consciences. He also noted the importance of ensuring truly anonymous confessions. In each city, he said, there ought to be at least one confessional where instead of a grill, there is a metal sheet with small holes, making it totally impossible to see the person making their confession. The person confessing should not be visible to the priest as they approach or leave, he continued. If there is a window on the priest's door, it should not be transparent. With these measures, the vast majority of the faithful can resolve the problem of shame, Father Fortea said. But for those truly very rare cases where shame is still a major obstacle, even with anonymous confessionals, additional steps can be taken. In these instances of extreme shame, the person can make an anonymous phone call to a priest in the city and tell him about this problem. Confession itself cannot take place over the phone, but in many cases, the phone conversation will be enough so the penitent can get up his confidence. If the penitent still finds that the shame of mentioning his sins is too great to bear, he can arrange for a written confession with the priest. Father Fortea also said that in several of the confessionals in Spain, it's possible for the penitent to move the screen slightly, just a fraction of an inch, and slip in a piece of paper. He offered guidelines for such written confessions. They should generally not be longer than one page, sins should be written in a clear and concise manner, or, if possible, should be typed for clarity in reading. The priest will give his counsel, the penance and absolution without needing to bring up any questions for the penitent. In this case, asking questions would be counterproductive. He noted that those who cannot hear or mute have always been permitted to make written confessions. And in the case of insurmountable shame, this would also be licit, he said. A psychological inability can be just as real as a physical one. 
Well then, that will be all for the video this time, and I truly hope all of you have learned a lot from this video, and if there's any feedback or suggestion, please let me know in the comments below. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.